Right. Uh, thank you, the or organizers, for the invitation and for letting me get away from this non-committing uh, title, which with this title you can talk about pretty much anything you want. Uh, but but the but I will uh, talk about something very concrete. First, I let me figure out where is the best place to stand here because I want to see <laughs> my my slides. Uh, uh, okay, I see them here. Okay, so that's the way to go. Uh, uh, all right. Um, so, uh, what's the sort of the broad uh, broad agenda here? Uh, something that um, many of us, uh, many of you, have seen uh, uh, coming up in the various uh, uh, areas, uh, including uh, uh, combinatorial optimization, theory of random graphs. Uh, uh, coding theory, machine learning, uh, and uh, many other places that uh, there is an apparent gap between um, uh, between what can be uh, established uh, in some by existential means in terms of solving some optimization problem with the random input versus what can be achieved by algorithmic uh, means. So I've, I've listed here a list of uh, uh, examples in uh, in the area which is closer to my interest in the random theory of random graphs, but you can substitute it with, with uh, similar objects from coding theory or whatnot. So, the, but the general kind of uh, uh, general situation is that you have some optimization problem you want to solve with the random input, um, and often uh, with a little bit of work or with actually a lot of hard work, you can say something about this optimization, uh, the value of the optimization problem. For example, what is the size of the maximum <coughs> independent set in a random graph? Uh, with some work, you can actually show that uh, that's, it's, the answer is blah. Uh, but then the second question is that, well, can you actually find that object? Can you solve this optimization problem with the promise that the input is random? Because the input is random, uh, the classical framework for the algorithmic hardness, such as the NP hardness and things like, or Sharpie hardness or things like that, is not applicable because uh, the uh, input is random. Uh, granted, there are many problems in this theoretical computer science area which are hard on average, such as the so-called uh, shortest lattice vector problem. Uh, but whether that such problems are applicable to these uh, settings that I'm interested in, uh, then it's uh, that's not uh, quite clear. Um, so uh, what we want to do is to, today is that I will use uh, uh, as uh, by uh, uh, as uh, for the illustration problem pro purposes I will focus on one concrete problem, and and instead of this for framework of NP hardness and things like that, uh, we will use an alternative framework for at least guessing what are the what is the reason for the apparent hardness of these problems uh, and the inspiration will come from statistical uh, physics uh, at the same time I will not assume any knowledge of statistical physics uh, and I certainly don't know much about it than most many people in the audience uh, one specific in uh, 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 property that we will be indicating hardness, apparent hardness uh, of such problems uh, is something that for the lack of a better term I'll call the overlap gap property that is uh, originating in the theory of statistical physics and spin glasses in particular. And it's related to the techniques of replica symmetry, replica symmetry breaking and all of that stuff. But that kind of, uh, this uh, set of techniques are not terribly important for the discussion. Uh, I'll stick with the, this uh, overlap gap property. Uh, so I will, what I will do is that I'll walk you through a one concrete problem uh, where this is, uh, this uh, apparent hardness appears, um, uh, and 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 and, and il to to illustrate the main uh, ideas. But before I and this problem is the so-called maximum submatrix problem that I'm about to introduce. But before I do that, I'll 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 describe another problem, which is uh, uh, arguably the most embarrassing algorithmic problem in the theory of random graphs. Um, so uh, it's uh, indeed in a very embarrassing situation. So here's the problem. Um, consider a vanilla Erdos-Renyi random graph. So we have a graph on n nodes, and every edge is present with probability p and epsilon with probability 1 minus p. Uh, p is constant, so it's, uh, it's a very dense graph. 
Um, in this graph, you consider the object, which is the, lar the largest in size clique. A clique is a connect collection, is a, uh, a subgraph which is fully connected. So you need to find uh, a collection of nodes which are all fully connected. And you ask yourself, what is the largest such object? How many nodes you can find in such a graph that are fully connected? And it turns out the answer is uh, pretty much twice log uh, n with base <coughs> 1 over p. Uh, and that's actually not terribly hard to show. It's an application of the fairly vanilla version of the so-called the first moment and second moment method. Uh, you simply look at the expected number of uh, cliques uh, of that size. Uh, and you see that, that if once you go above the size, the expectation goes to 0. And, but if you stay below the size, then, then the expectation goes to infinity. By itself, it doesn't tell you anything. But then you use a concentration inequality uh, that tells you that the answer is that. Um, now, if you're in sparse graphs, then you usually have to do a little bit uh, more work. But that, that's uh, for the second slide. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the largest clique. We know that with high probability in the random uh, Erdős-Renyi graph, the clique of that size exists. Now you want to find it. Uh, the, the, what about the algorithms? Um, uh, there is a trivial uh, algorithm, the greedy algorithm, that finds the cliques of the size half of that. Um, and calling it sort of historically called greedy algorithm, but I think calling it a greedy is giving it too much credit. Uh, it's uh, calling it even an algorithm is giving too much credit because it's, it's the dumbest algorithm one can imagine. Uh, all you do is just, just simply pick a node uh, and keep all the neighbors of the nodes and discard everybody else. So you have the reduced graph. And then within in this reduced graph, you pick another node, keep all the neighbors, discard everything else. So you hardly do any work. You don't look at the largest degree. You don't look at the, you don't write any kind of semi-definite programming. It, it's really like a very naive algorithm that you can imagine, uh, uh, and it will give you half of that. Uh, that that uh, fact was discovered back. Simple fact was was realized by uh, Carp in 1976, and back in 1976, almost 40 years ago, he challenged to do something better than that, uh, and it's still open. And this is a lot, uh, quite embarrassing uh, because you have this uh, uh, a, a particular problem where up to a certain threshold, half of the optimum, it's, uh, we, you find this solution with no work. And anything above that, it seems to be extremely problem problematic. This is a still an open problem. It's a, one of the major open problems in the theory of random graphs and, and, uh, and algorithms. Uh, and uh, now, more and more, because of the apparent failure to find the solution to this problem, it's believed it's, it's not too unreasonable to believe that the problem is hard, indeed. Uh, in a certain, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, although there's no formal uh, proof of that, uh, you might have seen a lot about the, another version of this problem, which is called the hidden click problem. Um, the hidden click problem, uh, in fact, was something that's not quite well realized, I think. Hidden click problem was motivated by this problem. It was invented to say something about what's going on, what's wrong with this pro problem. Uh, and the hidden click problem is used as the basis of various cryptographic schemes. So that's how much people have trust in the hardness uh, of this problem. All right, so I've, I think I've scared you enough with this uh, problem. Now let's uh, move on. I'm sorry? Uh, hidden click problem, I'll, I'll say it in, in words, but this is not a part of this talk, so I didn't uh, desc uh, describe it formally. Hidden click problem is that you take an erdos graph, uh, but you plant a click there of the size larger than, than twice log n. For example, you take uh, n to the one-third click. Um, and then you ask yourself the following question. Suppose I don't tell you whether there is a click or not. Can you actually discover that? Um, and can you discover it by polynomial time algorithm? Right? Now, uh, in principle, as long as the clique is size large is twice log n, you can discover it at least by the brute force. You're going to search for it. And if you find the clique larger than this, then you know that, that there is a clique there, hidden one. Uh, uh, major question, open question is whether you can actually do it in polynomial time. And it's known that if the click size is, la is square root n, you can actually do that by spectral method. But anything below square root of n is a uh, holy grail. And there's no, uh, and believed to be hard. Right. 
But I'll stick with a non-hidden click uh, uh, version. In fact, the problem I'm about to introduce is, is not even a random graph problem. It's something else. But uh, question, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, OK, real quick about, uh, really quickly, a similar story uh, takes uh, place in this uh, in the sparse uh, Erdos-Renyi graph. So if you have uh, look at the random graph with n nodes and edge probability is now of the order 1 over n. So d is the average degree. Uh, in that situation, it turns out that the largest independent, now the right object to look here is the independent set, not a clique. Clicks are will be very small in these graphs, but independent sets are, in fact, of linear size. And with some work, uh, now you have to work a little harder than before. You can show that the clicks, uh, in, sorry, independent sets have linear size, and the uh, the constant is twice log d uh, over d. Um, and if you want to, as, okay, so that that's existentially the answer. But if you want to actually actually find it by by fast algorithm. This story is very similar. Trivial algorithm will get you half of that, and nothing above that seems to be achievable. And uh, the, there is a question whether you can do better than that. Uh, and that there is a similar story with many other combinatorial optimization problem. The random case set problem is, is one of that has been looked at especially hard in not only in the random graph theory, but of course in statistical physics and, 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 and other communities uh, as well. So today I want to discuss, I want to show that something similar but not exactly the same happens in the variant of this problem, which is the largest submatrix problem. The problem formulation is extremely simple. Uh, we consider n by n uh, matrix with the IID Gaussian standard Gaussian entries. Okay? So it's n is of course, it's going to be large. You fix a k. Now, k might be either a large constant or growing. It depends on the type of results we, are, uh, we, we, we can uh, achieve. But for now, let, let me not fix it. But you think of k as something still much smaller. Think of k as something either a constant or up to log n. That's kind of a picture you should have in mind. Uh, we are, the goal is to find the k by k submatrix with the largest average entry. So you go through all possible submatrices, and you want to find the submatrix with the largest uh, average entry. That's, that's the problem. Okay? That's, uh, that's it. A um, uh, uh, little bit of history about uh, uh, that. Th this problem actually came up. Uh, um, so I'll, 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 uh, I have some intuition. Actually, let me. I'll come back to that slide and, and, and start with, the, with where did it come from, the application side of it, and really briefly mention that. Turns out that that problem has actually has been looked at by, in the applied fields in, in bioinformatics and genetics, and it's believed that the largest uh, submatrix correspond to some pathology, for example, in genetics. And uh, people have looked at the, uh, this, this problem in real life uh, matrices in uh, real life. Uh, the problem is a priori kind of hardish, right? So if you do try to do brute force, then you have uh, n choose k squared, uh, different submatrices to look at. So the brute force for large k is going to be quite, quite uh, difficult if n is large. Uh, but there is a natural, uh, nat natural heuristics uh, to look at it, which is a one can think of it as a natural analog of the greedy algorithm. It's called the iterative search procedure that has been um, uh, lo looked at in, 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 practical, uh, uh, in the practical instances. Uh, and the procedure is very simple. And uh, let me describe it now in, in a blackboard. Uh, so here's your big matrix. It's n by n. You fix k. And your goal is to find a matrix with the ideally largest average, mate, largest average value, or at least something close to that, or whatever you can do algorithmically. So here's, uh, here's the procedure. You fix uh, any of the k rows in your matrix. For example, let's uh, say first uh, k rows. And you search for the best matrix within those k rows. Um, now that is. Uh, once you fix the rows, k rows, and you want to find the best k by k submatrix, I wrote it uh, as if it was contiguous. It doesn't need to be contiguous. You just need to pick k columns here. 
Uh, that is easy to do because you simply look at the, the k uh, columns with the largest uh, sum of entries, and that's going to be your best one. And let's say this is, turns out to be the best. So this is your uh, first step in your algorithm. Once you find this matrix, what you do is you have to fix these k columns and search for the base matrix within those k columns. And let's say you find something like this. This is your next matrix. OK, then you have your new set of rows, and you find your next ba best matrix, let's say this one, and the next best co uh, column wise is this one. And you keep doing and going back and forth, uh, iterating between rows and columns until you get stuck. Uh, you will get stuck at some point, because every time you increase your average value of your matrix, so at some point you will reach, you, you will reach something which is the locally optimum. Locally in the sense that something which is not improvable in the rows and something which is not improvable in column-wise. All right, and uh, so that's where you get stuck. The question is, is it something that uh, matrix that you produce that way, is it good or not good? How close it is to optimality? Now, for, the, for that purpose, you need to know something about the optimality. So now let me say, describe a paper which is the motivating uh, work for, for our work and says something indeed about the existentially uh, optimal solution. It turns out that the uh, the, the globally optimal answer is given by this expression. It's square root of 4 log n divided by k. So in the matrix, n by n matrix, the uh, k by k submatrix, which achieves the largest average entry, this such largest average entry is given by this, um, uh, given by this expression. Uh, that expression, and in fact, all, asympto all asymptotics that will appear in this talk are not terribly mysterious. Uh, it turns out that sort of the wrong, you know, non-rigorous way to get this asymptotics is just to pretend that all the sub-matrices have independent average value. And if you, you have n choose k squared uh, uh, of matrices uh, of them, and if you look at the asymptotics, if you have n, capital N, Gaussian entries, the largest of them behaves like uh, this, standard deviation times square root of 2 log n. And if you plug naively this answer uh, here for, the, for your matrices, and of course, ev each average entry is a Gaussian, uh, and you just for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the standard deviation, then you will recover that answer. Uh, but of course, that's not a rigorous uh, result, because it just tells you, because you pretend that the average values are independent. They are not. But it turns out that they're fairly independent, independent enough for that answer to be true. And it's not too complicated to actually obtain this result. You have to use the method of moments as used in, often in, in the theory of random graphs. All right, so this is, this is what you want to do. And one of the questions is that uh, can you actually achieve this by algorithms? For example, the iterative search algorithm, can it, do, uh, can it achieve it or, uh, uh, or not? Uh, bound on the running time. Um, Is it even clear that that's actually an efficient algorithm? Right? right, that's a good point. Well, it's, uh, it's, it turns out to be efficient algorithm because we analyzed it, but, but a priori, without the analysis, yes, in principle, it could run, it could, it could run for, for sort of uh, super polynomial uh, time if k is not constant. Uh, yes, that's, that's, that's a fair point. In experiments, however, it was running, uh, it was uh, never taking a long time. So I'll skip this slide because this is just a formal de the description of the algorithm. I already did it. So, um, so now I'll continue describing what's been done by, in this paper by, by Midi, um, Day, and Nobel. So not only they obtain, they, they obtain the globally optimal uh, value, uh, which is square root of uh, 4 log n divided by k, what they show, they have another result which suggests that they, this iterative search procedure I just described should be square root 2 smaller than the globally optimal answer. Uh, as an evidence to that, uh, they uh, proved the following result. Um, they proved that in such matrices, in, OK, so you look at n by n Gaussian uh, matrix. And consider any k by k matrix which is locally optimum. So matrix which is not improvable by searching through the columns or searching through the rows. Such a matrix is called, uh, we'll, let's call it uh, locally optimum. What they showed is that the majority, the overwhelming majority of locally optimal matrices 
achieve the value which is this, which is, by the way, square root of two, uh, uh, square root two smaller than the globally optimal lens. Right? So that's, again, an existential result. Because the iterative search procedure stops at the locally optimal uh, matrix, that suggests, but it doesn't prove it, of course, but just suggests that, that that iterative search procedure should end up with that. The running time of that being another story, as uh, Rudy uh, uh, correctly pointed out, is uh, whether it will take a short time or not to run, that's, uh, that's another story. Um, OK, so now uh, some questions. First. Uh, indeed, what's the value? Is it true that the value produced by iterative search uh, procedure I just described is square root two smaller than the globally, uh, global uh, optimum answer? How, how much, uh, what's the running time of this algorithm? Are there better algorithms? Uh, are the algorithms achieving global optimality, for example? Uh, and if it's not, if there is a gap, what's the reason for the, uh, for the gap in complexity? So is there something happening uh, that prevents you from reaching the globally optimal answer. And jumping ahead to that bullet point is that, yes, there is a certain phase transition going on that will be described in the last part uh, uh, of the talk. Um, before we get to the uh, answering uh, these questions, uh, let me describe a much simpler algorithm, a, a different algorithm uh, uh, that is uh, for the same problem. So instead of the iterative search algorithm and trying to analyze this iterative search uh, algorithm procedure, which is actually very hard to analyze, you can consider doing something else. You can just directly pretend that you're, you're, instead of the Gaussian matrix, you have a 0, 1, you have an Erdos-Renyi matrix. You simply do the thresholding. You fix a threshold theta and keep entries which are above theta and discard entries which are below theta. And then instead of the Gaussian matrix, you have a 0, 1 matrix. Now, this matrix you can think of as the adjacency matrix of a bipartite random erdos renyi graph. Well, in bipartite erdos renyi graph, just as in non-bipartite case, uh, you can talk about cliques, and you can talk about algorithms for cliques. Right? Now, we know something about that. Uh, so we know, uh, f well, first, the probability here P is just a probability that the Gauss, standard Gaussian is above theta. And um, we know that uh, in such a graph, uh, the greedy algorithm will get you, it's half of the optimum, but that besides the, 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 the fact, the size of the clique will be log n, if you remember the formula, it's log n divided by log of the one of the probability uh, parameter which in our case is the probability that the Gaussian is at least theta. Now, what's the relevance to, to the uh, larger submatrix problem? If you have a clique, the clique corresponds to matrix of all ones. That means every entry there at least theta, that means that you constructed the matrix not only with average entry theta, uh, but minimum value theta. So you're doing even a little bit better than the average entry goal, right? So that now you can try to do the following simple thing. Adjust theta right enough so that the clique is size is k by k, because you want to find the matrix k by k, and see whether you can actually get the theta to be still large enough to get, to get maybe to the optimality or whatever you can get by this. Any questions? Yes? Is iterative a scheme? I'm sorry? Is iterative yes. Uh, nothing special about normal, and in fact, uh, in, 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 in the, except for the analysis that, that I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words um, uh, about. The, but you can pose any of these problems, uh, both algorithmically and existentially, for heavy tail distribution and, or exponential distribution and so on. In fact, the certain phase transition properties that, that, uh, that happens for Gaussian, I think are even more profound in those uh, cases. But the short answer is that has not been analyzed. But I think it's worth to be analyzing and seeing what's going on. So, uh, now, iterative search procedure, uh, I mentioned that we, we, for now we put it aside. Now we're a analyzing this other algorithm motivated by the greedy algorithm in random graphs. Uh, any other questions?
Right. So the thing is that, okay, obviously the largest theta, the better I'm doing because the largest minimum, uh, larger minimum value. But if I take theta too large, my click size is going to be too small, maybe two by two. But my goal is to construct a matrix k by k with the k is given to me externally, right? So I cannot take theta too large because then my clique will be simply correspond to smaller matrix than my goal is. So I have to take theta large enough, but so that the clique size is still k by k. And now you can ask, okay, what's the right value of theta that gives me that? And that the answer will be given, hopefully, <coughs> in the uh, next slide. So now I've, so, and now let me start summarizing some of the results. So the first question that I would like to answer uh, is that indeed what's the performance of the iterative uh, search procedure? Uh, second is what's the performance of this greedy algorithm? How much of a theta can you can pull off from this uh, 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 thing? So for, uh, starting with the first rega um, uh, question regarding the iterative search procedure, uh, lo and behold, uh, iterative search procedure is on the positive side, it runs in the polynomial time. In fact, it runs in a constant time in expectation. After constantly many rounds, it will stop and it will get stuck in the local optimality. Uh, and the answer will be given by square root of two smaller than the global optimum. So no surprises here. This is, I have to say that this is the uh, sort of, uh, sort of anti-climatic point in this research uh, uh, part because the, proving this theorem is about 20 pages of really hard work. Extremely non-gratifying because in the end of the day, we just confirmed something that was kind of conjectured anyway. So the most technical part of the paper is least interesting in a way, okay? But so is life, okay. Uh, but it's important, at least we know that this algorithm doesn't do miracles, it doesn't do anything uh, 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 super strange. It produces what was conjectured in the Bamidi uh, Day and, and Nobel paper. Interesting, Here, now, I think now the kind of, uh, even though on technical level things become, will become simpler, but the interesting thing starts emerging, I think. Uh, so hopefully we'll convince you of that. Surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, when you for the second algorithm based on the greedy, uh, uh, the greedy algorithm for clicks, uh, the best theta that you can pull off that can still correspond to k by k click gives you precisely the same asymptotics, square root of two log n over k, right? So you have one algorithm extremely hard to analyze gives you square root of two smaller than the global optimum. You'd have this other algorithm, which is you don't need to analyze because this was already done in a random uh, graph setting, gives you exact same asymptotics. Uh, having now, in light of these uh, two facts, uh, have two algorithms somewhat independent give you the same answer, and the answer is very similar in spirit to the what you get in clicks in a random graph. It's now tempting to conjecture, and I was pretty sure at that point of research that I was pretty sure that perhaps beating the square root of two bound is uh, hard. As hard as beating half factor two uh, for the clicks in random graphs, right? But first, again, any questions or, uh, about uh, what's on this slide? Yes? Uh, yeah, so click problem that I described at the beginning was for non-bipartite. It turns out the same story goes without a change for bipartite case as well, both in terms of existential result and in terms of the greedy algorithm. Okay, so uh, I was, I have to say, quite surprised when, when uh, Quan Li, my, my co-author and, and, and the student, came up with a better algorithm. Uh, and uh, we, we <laughs> ran out of, 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 ran out of uh, sort of uh, any, we, we're not terribly creating, creative in calling, uh, giving names to this algorithm, so I'll call it sequential greedy algorithm. And it's a very simple algorithm which, uh, which achieves four thirds better performance than this to those two algorithms before. Okay, so now perhaps it's good to keep in mind uh, some kind of a, uh, it's like a, a range uh, of. Um, so the global optimality, somewhere here, and it's whatever it is, four log uh, n over k, but that's kind of that number is let's put it aside. Uh, then there is the square root two log n over k here. So you can think of this as a factor square root of two uh, gap between uh, what's achievable by the two algorithms I described 
and the global optimality. And the algorithm, the new algorithm that we have constructed gives you four thirds. So four thirds, which is 1.33 and so on. And it's, it's good that it's smaller than 1.41 something, which is the square root of two. Otherwise, we would get something wrong. If, uh, um, uh, all right, so that's the way I want you to think about the performance of this algorithm. So there's square root of two gap, which is the holy grail that I would like to close. We didn't quite get there, we get up to four thirds um, uh, by means of this algorithm that I will um, describe. Please remind me the time when I need to stop. Uh, yes, so I think. I started at uh, 11.25, I think. Yes, so I think we still have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, very good. So let me uh, describe uh, the algorithm uh, in words. It's a very simple algorithm, simple both to describe and to run and to analyze. Uh, the algorithm, it's, it's just a different version of the greedy algorithm. What you do is that you fix a row. In this row, you find the largest element. That's it. Uh, then uh, it, it corresponds to a certain column. In this column, you find the second large, and then you, in this column, you find the largest element. Uh, if it coincides with the original ones, you find the second largest element. So you, that, that gives you a two by one matrix. Now you have two rows. In these two rows, you find another two elements with the largest sum of entry. So you have two by two matrix. Then you fix the two columns, you find a two by three matrix. Then you do a three by three matrix, three by four, and so on. So you slowly expand this matrix sort of from one two by one matrix into k by k matrix in this simple greedy fashion. Um, that's, the, that's the whole algorithm. Any questions? And Somewhat surprisingly, it does better than the other two algorithms. Uh, and it, and the, the reason it gives you four thirds is uh, I've, um, they are described on the slides. I'll go through that fairly simply. I don't mean that, I don't expect you to follow every step, but I just want to be convinced that every step follows just from fairly straightforward Gaussian asymptotics of the extreme Gaussian asymptotics. At every step, which happens, in fact, pretty much what happens is that you add a, a, a row sum or a column sum which corresponds to the uh, um, uh, largest of n Gaussian entries with the variance, uh, with the standard deviation of order square root t. Because it's t by one kind of uh, object that you add to that. And therefore, it has a symptotic square root of t log n. And all you need to do is just sum it up. Uh, and when you sum it up, then you have something like square root of t uh, integral showing up because you're adding objects, uh, 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 sum of the forms square root of, uh, of t. So you replace the summation by integration. You don't lose much by that. And that gives you 2 thirds. And because there is an extra factor on uh, 2 here, 2 comes from the fact that you're, using, you're doing columns and rows and columns and rows, then you get 4 thirds. That's more or less the entire proof. Uh, to pull it off uh, rigorously, you have to work around the independence uh, issue. So if you, you, you do have some dependency, but it turns out you can partition matrix into blocks which are independent and only select the extreme ones from those independent blocks. So that's, uh, that's a nice thing you, you can do. And that's the answer. Okay. So let's uh, summarize and now let's start discussing, uh, discussing the phase transition uh, property. So we, we managed to improve this, this uh, square root of 2 to something larger. We didn't quite close the gap. Uh, incidentally, if you're curious, if you do similar algorithm for the cliques in uh, erdos renyi graph, you don't get any improvement, right? I would be super shocked if we get to, to solve the uh, improve upon this 40 years open problem there. So that algorithm that works for the Gaussian entries doesn't work for the, for the random, uh, random graphs. There it's still factor 2. Uh, all right, so we, we, we managed to improve it, and you start working with the variance of these algorithms or other, but it, it still we don't uh, know. Um, we cannot uh, Im improve it, so it's time to start thinking about maybe this problem is indeed hard and whether there is an evidence of that, Fa perhaps phase transition evidence of that. You couldn't do the other problem. You couldn't just put on the edges Gaussians or something and then run an algorithm like that? On the edges Gaussians? So on the bipartite graph. To, 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 do the, to do for the click problem? Yeah. 
uh, we obviously look, didn't look at all the variants of, uh, of this, but if you do it in sort of naive way, it doesn't seem to be giving you anything. So you, you're saying replace zero uh, go edges by, by Gauss? From one to this, but you can also go backwards. Yeah, I, I think it will just give. give. You don't get a click because. Well, you get a click because basically you still. Well, you sort of get a click if you, you get almost a click, if, uh, but you can probably patch it to be a click with a little bit of sacrifice. But I think the average, uh, but, the, 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 but you will get from that. We've looked at that. I, yeah, uh, it looks like it's not, and I would be very surprised if it did. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? Of course, it's, it's not like p not equal to p type problem. Uh, but uh, uh, anyways, um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, and good. Then you get up right. To the structure that is larger, but then you can try optimizing within that larger structure. Right. Uh, I think. Uh, I think, and I believe that variants like that were used in those application papers in uh, bi biology and genetics. They do a lot of hacks there uh, to get to really sort of practically useful matrices. So they start with many starting matrices, not just one. They do the just the size, and in fact, there is, I think, some kind of a, like a heuristics how to just the size uh, uh, to get uh, good, good results. So empirically, it has been and tried. Theoretically, uh, admittedly, I don't, this is a fairly new question, so I, I don't think it has been exhaustively studied. Uh, and uh, it's quite possible that by varying the size, this four thirds is improvable. I do think that this four thirds is improvable. I don't think that's the best result one can get. Uh, um, uh, one, one can get. So perhaps by adjusting the sizes of the matrix, quite possibly. Right. Uh, but I, we do have a conjecture where, where uh, uh, at what threshold it is not improvable, and that's what I want to get to. Did, yes. Is there a connection that thinking about this in terms of restricted singular values with respect to sparse binary vectors? of the matrix. And somehow, like maybe if you, you take this approach, where once you pick out your first ones and the next ones are restricted, it's like not the largest one, but like the mm -hmm. big one or something. I think. I know that the spectral methods works very well for the hidden click version of the problem. Uh, I'm not sure what it does for the just a click and, <coughs> and hence by analogy with the largest submatrix problem. Mm, perhaps, uh, I think for clicks it doesn't do anything uh, interesting. For, for largest submatrix problem it might. So that's a, that's a very good point. Might, uh, worth, worth trying to see. OK, so, so let, let me continue. All right, so what's, what's, happening, what's happening in this interval? Um, now let me talk about the uh, phase transition, and specifically phase transition phrased in terms of the over, so-called overlap gap uh, property. So to, to, to discuss that, let's do the following. Let's fix the parameter alpha in between 4 thirds and square root of 2. In fact, let's fix it alpha in between 1 and square root of 2. So replace this 4 thirds by 1. And look in this collection of matrices achieving the average value parameterized by alpha. Just to remind you, when alpha is equal to 1, that's achievable by the two algorithms I described at the beginning, iterative search and the greedy algorithm. So 1 is achievable. When alpha is equal to 4 thirds, that's achievable by the new algorithm I just described. When alpha is square root 2, that's a holy grail. That's what you want to be. But it, at least it exists. We know that as long as alpha is less than square root of 2, matrices achieving such average value do exist by existential results. Okay? So let's fix the parameter alpha and look at the space of matrices, existential space of matrices achieving that average value. And within this uh, space of matrices, let's do the following. Let's look at the pairs of such matrices. Uh, and specifically look at pairs of matrices where the number of common rows and common columns is prescribed. 
So I fixed parameters y1 and y2, and I looked at pairs of matrices achieving value alpha such that they have y1 times k common rows and y2 times k common columns. Right? And uh, sort of pictorially, hope, hopefully this is clear enough, but just to uh, explain it again. So here's again our large n by n matrix. We look at the space of all matrices achieving average value alpha times whatever. Uh, and we look at those pairs of matrices which A, achieve that average value, and B, they have pre precisely Y1 times K common rows and Y2 times K common columns. Right? And let's look at the expected number of pairs of such matrices. That turns out to be, with a little bit of work, you can actually compute it. You can compute the expected number of such pairs. And that's given by the following expression. So there's a common asymptotic k log n. And there is a, uh, an exponent uh, constant here, which is given by this expression. You do that by, look, by the look, taking advantage of the Gaussianities. You look in detail, and it's actually not a difficult object uh, to, uh, to compute. It's a bit technical, but it's not terribly complicated. So, if you look at this constant, then this constant should tell you something. For example, if the constant is negative, if the constant f is negative, that expectation goes to zero exponentially fast, exponentially k log n exponentially, goes to zero, and therefore such an object does not exist. So it will, at least it will tell you that such pairs of matrices do not exist. If the constant is positive, the expectation goes to infinity. That suggests that the such matrices do exist. And in fact, by looking at second moment concentration, you can actually, one can show that they uh, do exist. So this, this is an interesting object to look at. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next slide, I'm going to plot this function uh, and use a color heat ma map uh, for the various values of alpha. So it turns out that there's a two-phase transition. One is interesting, one is not interesting. Let me start with non-interesting and get to the interesting one. But still, it's a phase transition, so I might as well describe it. So it turns out if alpha is less than square root of 3 divided by square root of 2, that you can compute by uh, doing some uh, sort of numerics, it turns out that in this case, f is positive everywhere. So what it means is that for any no fixed number of common rows and common columns, you can actually find two matrices which have exactly share exactly that many rows and that many columns. Uh, and that's true for every pair of, of values y1 and y2. y1 is here, y2 is here. The color here, the redness, indicates the ex value of the exponent. The larger the exponent, the redder the, the is the point. So you see it's a little bit lightish here and a little bit lightish here and more denser in this part. Uh, any questions? Is it clear what this two-dimensional diagram represents? Okay, so it turns out that when alpha is above the threshold, two, uh, root, two, uh, root 3 over root 2, but below some other threshold, and this is the really interesting threshold, 5 thirds square root of 2 over 3, then the region uh, looks like this. There is a white patches here. There is a white patches. Uh, which corresponds to the value f less than 0. Uh, and the interpretation is uh, hopefully clear, but let me just say it again. Uh, take, for example, this, this point. This is 0 0.09 and 0 0.02. What it means is that you cannot find the matrix with average value alpha, which have 90% common rows and 10% common columns. That mate, the, such pairs of matrices simply do not exist by this moment analysis I did, just described. But otherwise, you have this region which is connected. The meaning of this uh, uh, value, 1.3608, is that that's a point where the, uh, this object becomes disconnected. Uh, at exactly po this value, this region becomes ba barely connected through this critical point. And if you go above that, so if you alpha is larger than that value, uh, then the region is disconnected. And what it means is that, Just yes? Why is this on an absolute scale or on a scale of k? This is, uh, this is uh, rescaled by k. So y1 times k is the number of, of k. 
uh, the exponent, no, because uh, let me go back, because the actual expectation is behaves like a constant times k log n. So dependence on k is here. Yeah. So, so above the critical point, uh, the region is disconnected. And in fact, it's even disconnected in one dimensional setting, in, in, in a sense, in the following thing. So you notice that regardless of the number of common columns, if you, the number of common rows is between a little bit less than 0.3 and 0.4, you simply don't have matrices of that. So that means that the matrices exhibit an overlap gap properties. Pro, uh, overlap gap property. The overlaps of two matrices in terms of the number of common rows and columns is, ha, has a gap. It's either at least something or it, it's most something else once you're above this phase transition regime. Right? It has a dis, dis, uh, uh, discontinuity. And the interesting and intriguing thing about this is that that happens at 1.3608, which is a little bit above four thirds that it's achievable and a little bit below uh, 1.41, which you cannot beat anyway by existential result. Right? So it's tempting to believe, and I'll, I guess we'll, for the lack of the better information, we'll conjecture that above that value, that problem is hard. So that, that, that discontinuity is indeed a sort of a structural uh, obstacle for the tractability of algorithm for, for, that, for that problem. Any questions? Uh, yes? What's the first phase transition before or after the fourth term? Uh, first phase transition? The first one. Yeah, the first phase transition was that, that below this phase transition, this is entirely positive thing. And above it, it's not entirely positive. I don't think that has an, any algorithmic implication. It just so happens. Uh, uh, there is a, that's, it's a phase transition, but, but the I'm not sure there is any kind of interesting implications uh, of that. For this, however, that at least seems to, because it happens almost right above what's achievable, uh, then it's tempting to believe that this is the onset of the hardness uh, for the uh, problem. Now, uh, well, how much time I have uh, remaining? If, mm, minus, one. <laughs> minus one. Okay. So yeah, I'm uh, in a minute or too late, so. minute or too late and, and, and therefore, I, uh, uh, right. So in this minus one minute, uh, what I will say is that uh, this type of phase transition object is, are indeed a provable obstacle for a, for a restricted class of algorithms, which are uh, called the local algorithms, primarily described and which makes sense in the context of uh, sparse uh, graphs. So that's, that's actually the reason we started looking at this overlap property is because we know there are provable obstacles to algorithmic local algorithms in sparse random graphs for independent set and uh, related object, K set and uh, related um, uh, object. And, uh, and so uh, just a couple of uh, uh, results along this line. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, uh, this is my last slide. I'll, I'll, I'll say a few uh, words uh, uh, shortly. Uh, so one thing I, want, I, I would like to mention is that one point, we do believe that above 1.36, because of this overlap gap properties, the problem is hard. But I don't think that's exact threshold. I think it can be pushed a little bit before, below by looking at the overlaps of more than two matrices. I think if you look at the overlaps of three or four matrices and start analyzing the connectivity of the region appropriately defined, you can push it down. And indeed, you can push it down for the case of the independent set problem in sparse random graph. So there's a other version, the other problems where this is uh, indeed uh, pushable down. Uh, Something similar, in, intriguingly, somewhat simple, similar overlap gap property happens uh, to, to take place in this sparse regression problem uh, that was described uh, and, and ye uh, yes, yesterday, so related to the talk uh, 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 yesterday, but I'll, I'll, I'll only mention offline if you're interested about some work in progress we're doing, doing with, my, with my students. 
And uh, lots of interesting open questions. Improving four thirds would be, I think, very nice by various kinds of means. But I think the grand challenge is to indeed either to confirm or refute in some way this kind of a generic uh, conjecture that any time you see the overlap gap property, the problem is indeed hard on the average. I, uh, I, I think as of now, we don't have an, a natural example contradicting that uh, statement. In fact, we just see a confirmation of it in various uh, different uh, versions uh, of, this, of the constraint satisfaction problem with the random inputs. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.